Good morning, West Coast. It is eight minutes after nine o'clock. You're tuned into Long Beach Radio Thursday morning, January 26, 2012. And this has been a really fantastic week for me. I've had some great studio guests. Uh, we had the magician, uh, Evans Martin, in on Tuesday. We had Morgan Thorpe in yesterday talking about some fishing. And I've got Dan Lewis in the chair beside me today from Friends of Clackwood Sound here to talk a little bit about developments, um, well, I mean, with the results uh, affecting our local temperate rainforest and uh, what's going on with Friends of Clackwood Sound. So thanks for uh, coming into the studio, Dan. We've talked before, but we've never been able to get you into the into the house here. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jeff. So what's uh, what's going on? What's new in the world of, uh, well, Clackwood Sound and the Friends of Clackwood Sound? Well, Friends of Clackwood Sound have just uh, released uh, a scientist uh, declaration. About 130, more than 130 scientists across North America have um, come out and made a statement saying that the, uh, the rainforests of Clackwood Sound are very rare and globally significant and that um, they shouldn't be logged in, that we need to find a way to protect them, mm-hmm. and that in the short term we need to buy some time to uh, allow negotiations to happen so we can find a way to protect these forests while providing for a local economy. Yeah, uh, economic feasibility. So mm-hmm. before we get into the economic feasibility portion of it, why uh, and how rare, How why are the rainforests so significant and how rare really are they? Yeah, they're they're very rare. Like originally, temperate rainforests um, only covered a very small part of the planet's surface, and about half of those are gone. There's only four regions that have significant amounts left. Mm-hmm. British Columbia is one of those four regions. And so in British Columbia, the, the significant rainforests are in Haida Gwaii. Mm-hmm. They're up in the north and central coast in what's known as the Great Bear Rainforest, yeah. and they're right here in Clackwood Sound. Um, the Sierra Club released a map last week showing that there are very few intact valleys left on Vancouver Island mm-hmm. and that most of those are right here in Clackwood Sound. Yeah. So one of the things that's unique here, it's not just that we have little square patches of rainforest, mm-hmm. is that we have these valleys um, where there's been no industrial development. There's no roads in there. There's been yeah. no commercial logging. It's just been the sustainable use of the Nechanoth people for since time immemorial, yeah. um, which has left really very little impact. And so it's the fact that these valleys are intact. And so, as you know, around here, like when we talk about a watershed, the water is the rain yeah. and the shed is the, the hills. Yeah. And if you think of a valley, it's almost like the opposite of a roof where a roof sheds water off and yeah. drops it on both sides. A, funnel, a valley funnels it into the river. And so having these valleys with the forest cover means that the rain flow is moderated. The rivers don't flash flood. Yeah. And so they provide significant habitat for the um, animals such as the salmon, the wild salmon, and wolves and bears. So I guess the big thing about these forests here is that they're global refugia for wildlife, Mm -hmm. and they're also a significant um, store of carbon. And so they're a really good way to mitigate the uh, oncoming effects of of climate change. All right. Yeah. So uh, we were actually having a really quite an interesting talk about this before we got on the air, and I don't know if, how much we'll get into it. But uh, part of the concern, obviously, is that uh, a lot of these aren't protected in a national park sense or some other sort of thing. And a lot of it also uh, is falls under the jurisdiction of what some might see as uh, you know, the impoverished communities of a house and whatnot around the region that could definitely uh, benefit from the development. What's being done to, to mitigate that issue, uh, having, having the, the need for economic success for the surrounding communities, but also try to protect these, these resources. Yeah, well, there are some interesting new models coming up, and we're looking at a model that's been used up in the Great Bear Rainforest, where it was recognized that if a First Nation is going to protect uh, part of their territory, there's got to be some uh, way for them to generate uh, economic uh, well-being mm-hmm. at the same time. And so the model that we are uh, working on here in Clackwood Sound was used in the Great Bear Rainforest quite successfully, mm-hmm. where um, environmentalists were able to fundraise... Uh, millions of dollars yep. these funds were matched uh, one so we raised a certain amount of money and then the federal government kicked in another quarter and the uh, provincial government kicked in another quarter so mm-hmm. the two other levels of government came in with half the money and the environmentalists uh, were able to raise half the money mm-hmm. and that money was uh, used to um, provide economic development opportunities yep. for the first nations inhabitants of the great bear rainforest and that's been a model that's been very successful Um, The other thing is that from a First Nations perspective, um, you know, the kind of parks that we've seen in the past, the national parks, the provincial parks, Mm -hmm. lock people out of their own territories. Mm -hmm. 
And so one thing that was developed in the Great Bear Rainforest was a new park designation, which is much more similar to uh, what the Klaukwaut have got here with the tribal, the tribal parks. Park, yeah. So it is, it is a, a, a provincially recognized protected area, um, and certain kinds of development like logging, mining, hydroelectric development, those would not be allowed. But other uses can be done, non-timber forest products, mm-hmm. ecotourism. Um, yeah, like the zip line in, in yeah, the Yeah, those kind of things. Yeah, so we're, we're actually uh, negotiating right now to try to bring this model to play here in Clackwood Sound. And those negotiations are going very well. We're moving forward, and I'm feeling very positive that we can come to a solution that will be a win-win. Yeah. Um, do you have, I know we, I mentioned, the, you know, the, the zip line as a local example of, of some of that development that might have a, a positive economic thing. Is there, are there examples from the Great Bear Rainforest uh, region, that, anything that they've done there that... Uh yeah, there are. I mean, just to give you one example, there's um, a wood shop, woodworking shop up in the Great Bear where they are taking locally cut wood mm-hmm. and they're adding value to it. So it, it, part of the, the solution is to shift from a, a model where you just cut large volumes mm-hmm. of trees to where you generate large value from a smaller amount of trees. Mm-hmm. And so they've got this woodworking shop where they're making little toys for kids. Yep. And so, you know, there's a lot of parents out there. They don't want to be uh, buying toys that are made by child labor yeah, in China. Or out of plastic. And or, they, yeah, yeah. Yep. toxic plastic and stuff. So they're quite happy. They're looking for uh, locally made, uh, healthy alternatives mm-hmm. as toys for their kids. So that's just one example where they're um, generating huge amounts of revenue from very small amounts of wood. Yeah, so shipping a big log off to just get turned into paper elsewhere for X thousand dollars, you're getting significant market more by you know, producing the trees. Well, I see that as the, the... I had this explained, I think it might have been Giselle Martin, the the canoes, the dugout canoes were such a great example of that because you would take one tree and turn it into decades worth of food. <laughs> it just seems like such a such an easy economic decision to make in, in that, that, requ- that respect, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, you know, yeah, so Joe Martin is carving these canoes, which are worth a lot of money, mm-hmm. and then Giselle is taking those canoes and continuing to generate revenue again and again and again from that same tree. From that tribal tourism and, uh, and all that, yeah. Yeah, Really, yeah. really, really a neat, a neat thing. So um, you said these negotiations are going positively. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, I, th- I think the rainforest trees are pretty nice. <laughs> but uh, what's next for the Friends of Clackamas Sound? Are there any other exciting things on the uh, on the forefront? Or well, I think our big concern right now is um, Flores Island, which is in uh, Hauset territory, mm-hmm. and um, there's been a lot of engineering going on up there. Um, the local logging company has applied for; uh, they have a road permit. They could mm-hmm. start building a road any day if they wanted. Um, they have applied for heli drop permits. And they have a few already, mm-hmm. and they're currently applying for more heli drop permits. And, and what, just a heli drop permit. Yeah, or? a heli drop permit. Sorry, <laughs> that just means it's a permit that allows them to drop logs in the water. So if they are um, heli logging, that yep. just means that they they lift the logs off the ground with helicopter. Yep. They drop them in the water, boom them up, and ship them out. Okay. So um, you know, right now, uh, last week's Westerly had an ad, and they're applying for those permits, mm-hmm. for more heli drop permits. So, you know, it kind of looks like they're stacking up permits for Flores Island. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Flores Island is one of these intact areas that um, we certainly would like to see protected. And, you know, these scientists are saying these are the kinds of places that really need to be protected just from a scientific perspective. Mm-hmm. So I guess what we're really working on right now is trying to buy some time and, and, and hopefully we can hold off uh, any cutting of trees yeah. on Flores Island. So that those negotiations get a chance to run their course before uh, before that goes down. Yeah. Uh, can, can you clarify one thing for me a little bit? Um, I know a lot of people, uh, and this is something that comes up, a question I get asked quite frequently, a lot of people do think of Clackwood Sound as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve as a protected area, and you've said a couple of times now, uh, just this thing that it's effectively not protected. What does that UNESCO designation mean as far as the actual protection of the rainforest? Yeah, it it, it really means, what it means, uh, a biosphere reserve is meant to demonstrate, uh, it's supposed to highlight a a location like Clackwood Sound where there's a a demonstrated balance between human economic development and nature conservation. Mm. So that designation was applied in the year 2000, uh, seven years after the Clackwood decision. Now, the Clackwood decision uh, protected a third of Clackwood Sound, but it didn't protect the places that were going to be logged. Mm. If you look at a map of uh, where the mer- what they call merchantable timber mm. is, and you can see that um, the areas that were protected are the outer coastlines, uh, 
the bog forest, stuff yeah. that was never going to be logged. The mountain peaks. And- yeah. And so what's needed is uh, to expand the protected areas uh, to protect the areas where these big valley bottom trees are. Okay. And so the Bowser Reserve is a good thing in the sense that it's, it recogni- it's a recognition that mm-hmm. this area is globally significant. I think the downside of the Bowser Reserve is that it has created the perception that somehow Clackwood Sound is protected. Yeah. And so we've been kind of having to work against that perception in order to just remind people that nothing's really changed since 1993, um, other than there have been developments like the scientific panel is now in place, so logging methods have improved since 1993. Um, and the the scientific panel did set aside watershed reserves, mm-hmm. but they're too small. Like for an animal like a wolf, they can't live in a watershed reserve. They need large areas to roam. And what we're finding is that they can move huge distances in a day. And so they need large intact areas in order to actually survive. There's nowhere else on Vancouver Island left. And so Clackwood Sound is the only option left for the uh, large carnivores like the wolves, cougars, and bears. All right. um, More information, of course, always at focs.ca. Got a new website coming soon, I think. Yes, we do. Do you have these press releases there for people to uh, check out? Yes, we do. As well? All right. Well, is that all all you got? Well, thanks for coming in, Dan. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Anytime. And uh, we will just quickly jump. I didn't think of a... Do you have a request? Uh, When a Tree Falls in the Forest by Bruce Coburn. I should have guessed. (laughs) All right. We'll be back after some Bruce Coburn with... uh, Oh, do I even have that song? Are you kidding me? Well, you're getting waiting for a miracle. I don't okay, know. good. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll that works. That's exactly what we're waiting All for. All right, I'll be back with a surf report in a bit. Good morning, West Coast.